can de-risk with diversification to our heart's content, but ultimately we can only de-risk to the extent that we can imagine the risk. I'm sure the fitness studio that I worked for in Dallas thought that they had de-risked their business plan to perfection. And then a global pandemic started and they were forced to shut down and pivot to digital. And I bet if you had given them a thousand guesses in January, 2020 of what would be their biggest financial business obstacle that year, they would not have guessed pandemic. And this is why I believe regret minimization to be an even more powerful framework around which to orient our financial decisions because it stops trying to predict what's going to happen and it basically just asks what do you think you're going to regret the least later if everything you're expecting to happen doesn't work out the way you think it will it doesn't waste time asking why it's not going to work out or what's going to happen it just acknowledges that it might not and then it begs you to consider alternative plans of action Welcome back, rich girls and boys, to The Money with Katie Show, the show that looks at personal finance with a wider lens and dives deep into the money topics that matter. I am your host, Katie Gaddy Tossan, and the show is about the broader financial decisions that have a major impact on your life. Anyway, back to business. Today, we are talking all about investing with a regret minimization framework, passive indexing, and why that might be a bit of a misnomer. The thing is, if you listen to a lot of personal finance content, you probably don't need to be convinced that an index fund is a smart move. And you'll hear more from Eric later in his interview about just how smart it is, but I wanted to couch this conversation today in the broader context of what I assume other people are worried about right now, because it's what I'm worried about too, frankly, and that's future returns being lower because of the current valuations, the bear market, and our country's national debt. Or maybe I'm the only regular person who worries about this. I don't know. Maybe I should just lay off the podcasts. Anyway, I get messages about this all the time, specifically this year. The S&P 500 is going to have terrible returns over the next decade, people will tell me, as if it's this foregone conclusion. And presumably they are repeating what they're hearing in the media or they're quoting studies from Vanguard itself with predictions for the future. Here's the thing, though. We really don't know. And I will absolutely kick myself if over the next 10 years I stop investing in the S&P 500 and it ends up tripling again. The other thing that these types of comments seem to ignore is that there are index funds that track everything. The S&P 500 is just one index that you can track. So to swear off index funds altogether isn't really a logical solution to the concern that future S&P 500 returns will be lower. Because even if that does end up being true, and like I said, I have no idea if it will or not, I have a feeling that sentiment is pretty pervasive throughout history. People predict crashes every year, and obviously every once in a while, they're right. Not because they were actually predicting the future, but because if you predict the same thing enough times, eventually it's going to happen. I and the definition of an optimistic pessimist. I tend to think that we have a very strong recency bias as humans, that we always think this time it's different when it comes to the stock market or to the forces that manipulate it intentionally or unintentionally. It's natural. It's natural to think that we are in the midst of something that has never happened before in human history, though realistically, it's probably not true. And I talk a lot about this on the blog under the investing and financial psychology categories if you want a deeper dive. But that doesn't change the fact that I want to hedge. Just in case it's true, what do we do? How do we navigate it? How do we navigate an uncertain future with our scarce resources? What if returns really are terrible for the next 10 years, even 20 years? Is the solution to not invest at all? Well, I would hope we would both know the answer is no, partially because we know that the decades following that might still be really great, but more realistically, because even if the people who claim to know for sure don't actually have any idea what's going to happen over the next 10 or 20 years, nobody does. So it all got me thinking, how do we... How do we work with this reality? How do we kind of deal with this uncertain future and the, uh, the chance that things could be lower in the future? Enter my regret minimization framework for making investment choices. Now, I'm really just applying a fancy name to something that I've been doing with my asset allocation since I started investing called regret minimization. 
It basically means that you make decisions that you think will mitigate any future feelings of resentment with yourself later. That means I was buying small cap value funds and international funds and bond funds, even though the S&P 500 was crushing because I knew that if I concentrated all my money in one single index on one bet, that there was a higher than zero chance that I would regret it later. Even though those holdings, the international small cap value, what have you, haven't done well during the time that growth stocks were soaring, I still hung on to them because the diversification minimized my chances of regretting going all in on one single thing later. But in this context, the regret minimization is more so applied to how much money you are dumping into your stock portfolio as a whole compared to alternative investments or even spending. I am an investor who, at this phase of my wealth building journey, only owns stocks and bonds and private real estate through crowdfunding. I don't own any physical real estate. I don't own any small businesses aside from my own. And even that kind of belongs to someone else now since I got acquired by Morning Brew. And the truth is, we are facing a scary time to be an investor in U.S. equities because everywhere we turn, we're being told that future returns are guaranteed to be lower and that the U.S. itself is in a very precarious position. And I don't even necessarily dispute those facts. I just feel like we still need to handle them. Like whether they are true or not, we need to address them logically and figure out how we move forward. This is where we apply regret minimization. Think about it like this. If you invest all of your money into the stock market, and you live on as little as humanly possible, you make yourself miserable in the meantime, right? Then the value of our stock market starts eroding a la Japan in the 90s and it never comes back, hypothetically, or rather maybe it takes 50 years to come back. You're probably gonna be pretty pissed that you didn't live as happily as you could have along the way, but you'll probably only be really pissed if you chose to make tons of sacrifices in order to invest and you never enjoyed any of your money now because you staked your entire future happiness on the assumption that the stock market would make your sacrifice worth it. The stock market makes no such promise. The opposite is also true. If you choose not to invest out of fear of future returns being lower and the market ends up going bananas and continuing to return its average annualized 10% before inflation, you're probably going to be pretty bummed in 30 years from now that rather than sitting on a few million bucks, you've got a garage full of toys and some cash on the side. So in short, it's less about optimizing for the best returns and more about optimizing for the least regret. This is why I still spend my discretionary funds today. I could probably shave $2,000 off of our monthly budget and invest an extra $24,000 per year. We could live in a smaller house. We could stop going on trips or going out to eat. But the reality is for as much money as I am shoveling into the stock market week after week, month after month, I, I really have no idea if I'm going to actually end up wealthy as a result. Now, I'm pretty confident based on the historical data that by the time I'm 60, I will have significantly more but I have no idea if by the time I'm 40, I'll have substantially more. I would imagine I'd have more to some extent just based on historical returns, but you just never know. And this is why I personally no longer choose to be extremely frugal because I know that I'm setting myself up for a lot of regret later if the stock market doesn't do what I am expecting it to do. Now let's shift gears and let's talk about the relationship between regret and risk because here's the other side of this coin there's a part of me that thinks it's a little bit funny that everyone with a personal finance twitter account and access to cnbc seems so resigned to the fact that it's just a given that the market in the next 10 years won't be any good and it makes me think of that morgan Housel quote that risk is what you don't see we are all so certain that a recession is coming and it very well may and that the stock market will take many, many years to recover from that, and it may. But there's something ironic about foregone conclusions like these when people start assuming that they know what's going to happen because they often change their behavior preemptively as if it's already true. So think about life for a moment in 2019 and what was making headlines in 2019. It was Brexit hurting trade between Europe and the US, 
It was tensions between Trump and China and China in general, including trade wars and increasing prices. And people assumed that this stuff was going to measurably impact global markets and the U.S. market by extension. But do you know what practically nobody was talking about? The fact that there was a rare virus slowly, quietly spreading across parts of Asia and Europe. The one thing that ended up making the market drop 30% in a single month was not a headline at all in 2019. Nobody in the mainstream media or the personal finance world was expecting it and planning for it and nervous about it. So as Housel says, risk is what you don't see because you can address the factors that you can see. Risk is everything that's left over after you have adjusted for all of the variables that you know about. And because by definition, you don't know about those remaining variables, it's pretty impossible to plan for them. So if everyone is convinced that, you know, they've got the next few decades mapped out on the big screen, thanks to our apparent, you know, collective crystal ball, that collective confidence makes me think it's actually fairly unlikely. In the year 1999, people were worried about Y2K and the havoc that would be unleashed on financial markets when computers struggled to switch from the 20th century to the 21st century. It was in every major headline. People were bracing their portfolios accordingly, but nobody was worried about terrorism and two planes crashed into the Twin Towers, but Y2K didn't end up being an issue at all. And two planes did crash into the Twin Towers, which changed life for Americans and in some ways the entire world forever. The point is that the stuff that we are usually most aware of and afraid of rarely ends up being the stuff that changes the world. So we can de-risk with diversification to our heart's content, but ultimately we can only de-risk to the extent that we can imagine the risk. I'm sure the fitness studio that I worked for in Dallas thought that they had de-risked their business plan to perfection. And then a global pandemic started and they were forced to shut down and pivot to digital. And I bet if you had given them a thousand guesses in January, 2020 of what would be their biggest financial business obstacle that year, they would not have guessed pandemic. And this is why I believe regret minimization to be an even more powerful framework around which to orient our financial decisions because it stops trying to predict what's going to happen. And it basically just asks, what do you think you're going to regret the least later if everything you're expecting to happen doesn't work out the way you think it will? It doesn't waste time asking why it's not going to work out or what's going to happen. It just acknowledges that it might not. And then it begs you to consider alternative plans of action. In my case, it was choosing to reject extreme frugality. Like if I'm going to make a bunch of money and save most of it, I'm going to take the extremeness dial, turn it down a notch or two, because if it all goes to shit and everything I dump in the market gets set on fire, I'm going to regret those decisions a lot less if I still got to enjoy my life along the way. The flip side, of course, and the, um, the risk that I'm accepting is that I won't be financially free as quickly. And that's something I'm okay with because, and this is the key, Financial freedom was never a guarantee anyway. The stock market is, at the end of the day, a very, very safe gamble over the long term. But it is a gamble nonetheless. It's not a risk-free bet. It's just a risk that gets mitigated the longer you stay in the game. And this is why you always hear conversations about risk tolerance tied to time horizons. Because realistically, needing money in five years from now is a very different bet that you're placing on the market than needing money 50 years from now. The longer you stay invested, the better the chances that things will smooth out and average up. This is why the whole, should I invest my house down payment conversation is so fundamentally hinged on your ability to stomach risk and your flexibility. If someone who started saving for a $50,000 down payment in 2020 for a home that they planned to buy in 2022 decided not to invest that down payment because they were afraid to lose it, they'd probably be pretty pissed in January 2022 as the home they wanted to buy in 2020 costs 40% more now and their down payment isn't big enough anymore because they now know in retrospect what the market did in 2021. Whereas someone who decided to ride the bull market in 2021 to buy a house in June of 2022 might also be pretty pissed right now because they have likely lost money this year. 
it's hard to know for sure what's going to happen in those short-term windows. So you really have to be comfortable with the fact that your down payment could either grow by 25% or get chopped in half. And if you're flexible and you don't care, then great, risk it. But if you aren't flexible, that's worth knowing before you sock it away in the market and assume that it's just going to be larger in 18 months from now. Regret minimization works really, really well in other areas of your work and life too. Someone asked me when I was weighing the decision to do money with Katie full time or keep my responsible high paying tech job. Well, which do you think you'll look back on and regret more taking the chance or not taking the chance? And the decision became very easy when it was framed that way. And it sounds morbid, but I literally imagined myself on my deathbed looking back at my life and I thought, Is that old woman going to look back on this time and think, man, I'm really happy I stayed at Facebook and played it safe and didn't take a chance on my own ability to fulfill my dreams? No, she'd probably be like, man, I wonder how my life could have been different had I been a little braver. The risks that I couldn't have foreseen about doing money with Katie full time still haven't outweighed the upside of taking it full time. Now, I don't want to oversimplify the larger macroeconomic and global trends that professional wealth managers are worried about right now. I don't want to downplay it, but I do think on some level, regular people should not be concerned with this stuff day to day. If your full-time job is getting the highest returns possible, then yes, you should probably be studying this shit day in and day out and trying to make moves that you believe are going to increase your returns and lower your risk. But frankly, for the rest of us, even for people like me who write about this stuff full-time, I think it kind of defeats the purpose of having money to spend if you spend all your time worried about that money. And this is why I like the regret minimization framework as an every woman's approach to this stuff, because it acknowledges that we don't have control beyond diversification over what our investments do. And it reinforces that that money is really just a means to an end. So if we sacrifice the ends for the sake of the means, we are losing the plot. And in this example, I consider sacrificing the ends to be worrying 24 seven about what the stock market's going to do and trying to outsmart it. This is why I think most of us agree that just buying an index fund and holding it for the long term is typically the smartest and simplest and path of least resistance. So let me make a masterful segue now. Nobody has done more for this every woman retail investor who wants that broad market exposure and low fees than Jack Bogle. Jack Bogle is the founder of Vanguard as well as the mastermind behind the index fund among other people. And he was hated on Wall Street for this invention. The best book that I've ever read about him comes from Eric Balkunas, who's here with us today to talk about it. Eric is a senior ETF analyst at Bloomberg. So Eric, welcome to The Money with Katie Show. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So before we jump into all of the hardball questions, I am really curious why you wanted to write a book about Jack Bogle. Um, Two main reasons, I think. Uh, I had interviewed him three times in the five years before he passed away. Mm. And when the pandemic hit, I was like, I had three and a half hours of good audio with Bogle. And, you know, I I spent time with this really, I think, impactful, great man. Mm -hmm. And so let me translate some of that into a book. Um, I also thought that I could give it a Gen X treatment. You know, (laughs) a lot of the books on him and by him are are written by older people. And they're very good. They're solid. Um, I wanted to have a little more fun with him and show his punk rockery a little bit, Um, you know, for hopefully the younger people to understand this guy was really interesting and Mm -hmm. different. The other reason I want to do it is because as an ETF analyst for Bloomberg, uh, for years, the the flows have just been so astonishing uh, that that when you look at where all the money is going and you pull the thread on it, you end up in 1974 in his decision to set up a mutual ownership uh, company. And that decision, along with the index fund, has really governed most of the flows in America today. So Vanguard alone has taken in one billion a day for the last 10 years. That stat is just ridiculous. Staggering. Um, you know, we get comfortable with that stat, but it, it is really absurd. And the other, the rest of the money goes to people who copied Vanguard's <laughs> index funds, like BlackRock and Schwab and Fidelity and whatnot. So. You know, the amount of money that this one guy's decision and his life's work uh, have influenced is astronomical. And so I wanted to combine those two things um, into a book 
And, and, the, and the, but you, in order to write a book, it has to gnaw at you. I, I knew yeah. it would gnaw at me if I didn't do it. And so <laughs> I was like, I have to do this. Yeah, I loved your description in the book about how the mutual ownership set up. And I, I didn't know this about Vanguard until fairly recently that like the the shareholders are the investors there. You know, so there's not this conflict of interest. And you described that as like an anti-capitalist move because Bogle could have made himself disgustingly wealthy um, because of these inflows. And he chose not to. And that that's a major reason why you know, that model hasn't been replicated because it kind of goes against the basic premise of like, you know, maximizing profitability. Yeah, um, it, it's it's almost like you're setting up an asset manager and you purposely turn over all the future profits to the customers. <laughs> um, I, it's just not a capitalist move. Yeah, there's yeah. no incentive to do that. People, especially if you're going to work that hard and, you know, he's right. a, a, a pedigree he was a hard worker. Usually, if you're like, if I'm going to throw myself into this, I, I want to make a lot of money. Um, totally. And that's fine. That's capitalism. I have no criticism of people mm -hmm. who do it. I, but that's why the book is on this guy, because he did chose yeah. purposely not to do that. He was well off, though. He was not like, you know, he was yeah. not poor money stretch. <laughs> he wasn't a But by Wall Street standards, he was pretty poor, especially yeah. for setting up the biggest fund company that the world's ever seen. Um, but I will say, turning over the profits to the investor is why they became so popular. Mm -hmm. And um, I think ultimately, Bogle was just built differently. I think he was miscast in this industry a bit. Um, he just he didn't have any. He he was World War II generation. He was you know brought up to save. Just didn't have that that gene that wants a lot of money. Yeah, he didn't have that. Um, and it took a unique guy to produce this unique structure, as you say, where ultimately the investors own the fund company. So whenever they get assets and profits, they they say, well, what's in my best interest? Well, lower fees. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how Vanguard has rolled for 45 years. And that's why we're at a place today where the index fund is 0.03% of, of a fee. Um, it started at like 46 basis points and it came down to three. But that took 45 years of this sort of rinse and repeat of Vanguard's ownership structure. And that's why I think it's lasting. This is an organic process. There's no, there's no funny business, you know. There's no like, oh, we're going to give you this cheap thing here, but we're going to charge you over here where you're not looking. It's a pretty pure organic situation, and that's why it's become so impactful. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think nothing short of radical. And so I think we all probably know, or rather someone that typically listens to a personal finance podcast probably knows how Jack Bogle felt about index funds, given the fact that he's the one that brought them to market. But what did Jack think of ETFs? Because the ETFs came later, and I think this is kind of a, an interesting like idiosyncrasy from him. Yeah, so ETFs have done a, a lot to spread the indexing message, mm -hmm. um, and ETFs are just easier to find than in a, in a Vanguard for, well, under Bogle, sort of required you to come to him. Mm -hmm. You had to leave wherever you were and go buy a Vanguard index fund, and people did. Um, which is part of the story that's so unique. He, he operated outside of the system. He did not give any commission. So he, did, he really built that the hard way. And I think with ETFs, when they came along, the guy who started the first ETF, Nate Most, at the American Stock Exchange, his whole goal, I mean, he's in, at an exchange. Mm -hmm. They were third in trading. They wanted to get more volume. So they said, hey, why don't we trade a basket of stocks and maybe that will get us more volume. So it was just an idea to get trading up. Yeah. So the core of the ETF was to trade. That was the main idea. So <laughs> it worked. Yeah, they trade a ton. They're going to trade $50 trillion worth of shares this year. Um, and that's what bothered Bogle. Um, that guy, Nate Most, went to see Bogle, actually, and, and say, can we have the Vanguard Index Fund be the first ETF? And Bogle was like, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Although they, they were friendly. He said they had a good friendship over the years. But he said, no, I'm not doing this. Um, so then he goes to State Street, and they set up the first ETF, SPY. So that's, where, that's how that worked. He went to Vanguard first, though. He gave Bogle first crack at it. But then like six years later, after SPY launched and was pretty successful, Vanguard launched their ETFs. And that's sort of, I think, where Bogle got pretty upset. Um, you know, he had said no, but then when he stepped down as CEO, the new CEO and the CIO decided to do it. And that, that really started a rift between Bogle and Vanguard mm -hmm. for a long time. But his two problems with the ETFs are the trading. He just didn't like that you trade. He's like, why, you know, he was a 50 year, just hold the market for 50 years, 40 years. Yeah. Trading is the enemy of returns. Why would you want to take my index fund? I gave you the Mona Lisa. 
and have it trade. It's like staining the Mona Lisa. Yeah. Why do this? Then he would also hate the marketing. Uh, a lot of um, gimmickry and marketing yeah. and leveraged has sort of descended into the ETF world. That's where all of the, quote, innovation happens now. And he was not a fan of 80%, 90% of innovation in the fund world. So those are the two things that bothered him. That said, when I met with him, and I'm an ETF analyst, I have a soft spot for a lot of the ETF world. So I debated him uh, rigorously in each of these interviews, and he loved it. He loved debating. And ultimately, I could get him to resign to the fact that if you bought and held a broad yes. market ETF like VOO or VTI, he had no problem with that. And he would say yes. But then he would go, but nobody's really doing it. We don't know. We have no evidence. These things are bad, yada, yada. But he would acknowledge that. That's about as, as close as I get him to a compromise. <laughs> I love that you went toe to toe with I don't think I would have the, the courage to debate Jack Bogle on anything. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I tell people I felt like the, uh, the box that keeps the skeets. And I would just send out a skeet into the air. And he was the <laughs> skeet shooter. And he would just blow out my argument. Every time, so it was like, and, you're keeping um, some you know, safe distance from the argument. You're like, mm, yes, send it over that's there. right. So, because I, I would be like, well, look, let's say you have opinion that semiconductors are a great industry, and there's not a lot of semiconductor exposure in the broad market ETF. So, isn't that a good reason to buy like the semiconductor ETF? You get a diversified basket, and that's a good argument, right? Well, his 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 reply is. Well, now you're speculating, and anybody mm -hmm. who speculates is a damn fool. <laughs> and, and that's it. And so, and then, I, and then I would be like, well, what about like, what about the fact that like Vanguard is going into, say, um, this uh, emerging market small cap area yeah. or smart beta? At least they're lowering the fees for investors. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, if you're making the argument that we should just go into a place that's junk and make the junk cheaper, I just can't buy into that. So, like, you see how he would just the, – the problem with Vogel, if you're, if you're into, into ETFs is, or in, into a lot of things, is that he just was a purist. He said, yeah. you, the total market index fund is all you need. You don't even need international. Hold it for 50 years. And over as he got older and older, he locked into that. Mm -hmm. And anything outside of that became just useless, a distraction, an exercise in futility. So you could throw all this stuff at him. And he's operating from that mindset. And so obviously he's just going to sort of nix all of your points. Um, but what's interesting about Bogle is over the years, he launched the growth fund at, at Vanguard. He launched the value fund. He launched a, a industry funds. He would, he would come to dump on all of these areas that he, that he, he pioneered, <laughs> which is also interesting. He was a complicated guy, yeah. um, but that was part of the fun of debating him, which yeah. is that he was fired up. I really like learning about people that become legendary in their fields like that because I think we typically refine the edges a lot and we we gloss over some of those contradictions. I think that's why your book was so enjoyable. So when we're talking about like VTI or he's saying, hey, just own the total market index fund, hold it for 50 years, call it a day. Typically, we refer to that colloquially as passive investing and i have heard you say in the past like there's no such thing as passive or like passive is kind of a misnomer and we will typically reference passive you know juxtaposed to active management why do you consider all index funds active in some way or to some degree yeah because even if you bought if you buy the s p 500 that's a large cap bet right you, you don't have any small caps or mid caps and it's it's tilted towards growth a bit um, and tech. And so you're making some sector bets too in, in a weird way. Um, and in addition, the S&P 500 has rules. You have to have uh, four quarters of, of uh, positive earnings to get into the index. And then there's a committee that can actually just say, even though you, this stock qualifies, we don't like it. That's what happened with Tesla. I mean, it's, it's almost literally active managed. <laughs> I mean, it's, so if the S&P is an active, or isn't passive, then you know, really nothing is. Even the total market, VTI, you could argue, well, that's, that's not really passive because you're now betting on the U.S. only. But I would argue VTI is probably the closest thing to truly passive. The academics would say a global portfolio, market cap weighted, would be the passive. Uh, but I, I don't know. I just think that this is where I focus the book on the costs because what, what Bogle's life's work should really be, be remembered for is low cost. He should be the father of low cost, not index funds. Index funds get way too much credit for the index fund revolution, in my opinion. They're only a smash hit because they're cheap, and they're only cheap because of that structure. Because 
index funds, honestly, they it's like they start the race from the starting line. An active manager has to start at like 20 yards behind because they've got all these fees to overcome just to get to nothing. And that is a major advantage. Um, and so what Vogel essentially did was just remove over 40 years all the friction between an investor and that market exposure. That said, you know, uh, the indexes are built differently. The Russell 1000 is different than the S&P. And, you know, but they largely get to the same place. Even the Dow, which is price weighted, uh, gets you somewhat to the same place as the S&P 500. But there are deviations between these indexes. So there, it's active in that there's deviations between indexes. And it's active in that you, the investor, when you decide how, what percent to put into U.S. equities versus international versus small cap, that's all active decisions. And in fact, those are the active decisions that really matter, is that asset allocation active decision. They matter way more than nitpicking in the indexes. So I think the word passive, it's great to communicate, and I still use the word, but I think it does, um, it, it almost takes away from what really is the uh, attraction here, and that is dirt cheap. You know, low cost is really what makes these indexes powerful, and, um, but there, you know, there really is no such thing as passive. I think that's a, a fine, I'll stand by that. Although, there, you know, like VTI is close. Yeah. Are you familiar with the Rational Reminder guys? I'm not. Uh, ben and Cameron, they are Canadian wealth managers. Anyway, they have an episode where they kind of dig into this and they analyzed um, nine different small cap value funds and found that both their holdings and their returns were kind of wildly different. And I think that illustrates, I can't remember just how extreme it was, but I do think that illustrates this idea that, you know, these indexes, they're not, they're not like naturally occurring phenomenons. Like someone has to decide what goes into an index or has to set the parameters and the rules. And anyway, I just thought that was interesting. So when we talk about indexing or passive investing, like typically this is all associated with this ethos that we've already kind of touched on of buy and hold. Did buy and hold start with Bogle? Is he just the one that popularized it? Like let walk our listeners through this idea of buying and holding. Cause I think it's a little more complex than just that surface level kind of explanation. Um, you know, I think Buffett was very into long-term periods. And, and so Bogle didn't invent buy and hold mm. by any means. Um, he pushed it. I mean, he, he was a, long-term guy, uh, you know, early on, um, he, he saw that there were cycles and he, a lot of his career was sort of spent like trying to explain, like, listen, um, speculative return can like create a fog that help that makes it hard to see the investment return that stocks give off. And so he really tried to help people in many different ways, sort of see through the price action Mm -hmm. um, and the gambling nature of the market to see what are we really, we're trying to benefit from the value that all these corporations create. You get to ride capitalism's coattails. Your money literally works for you. <laughs> That's why he loves stocks in particular uh, and hated commodities uh, because you don't have that in a commodity or crypto situation. Yeah. So I think he was much like Buffett in that long-termism. Um, I In the chapter 10, which I call the art of doing nothing, I look at behavior, which is, in my opinion, the new part of this investment enlightened era. I think low cost was the first stage, behavior is the, the second. And right now we're gonna have a big test, right, with the mm -hmm. market down. Yeah. I think Bogle's contribution to behavior wasn't so much his voice and his words, but it was just simply providing a low cost index fund into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Because I think it really allowed people to resign themselves that this is the best deal possible. You know, even if the market's down, what am I gonna do? Jump from this and try to ride some hot 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 ticket yeah. for a minute but then that'll fall and they go through this like nah i'll just stay in the index fund mm -hmm. and so just providing that i think he really helped the buy and hold movement and a lot of advisors subscribe to this and now they're they talk about their value add being behavioral coaching um but i think buy and hold is is uh something that would sh should be even applied to factor investing active management yeah. Because like you could have a great active strategy, but it could take 10 years to really right. actually come to fruition. But the problem with investors is they tend to just have tough time hanging on to a strategy when it's down in the dumps. But index funds, they find it way easier to hang on to that strategy because my theory on this is that people find that the low cost is the alpha. Um, ah. And so they already locked in the alpha with the low fee. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to chase alpha anywhere else. Um, and and that's, that is a major 
underrated um, con- contribution to buy-, buy and hold and behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, I think someone like Buffett is really special in that he can buy these stocks and, and, and wait it out. Yeah. Um, it's harder for most people to do that because it goes against human nature. And in that chapter, I talk about the media makes it difficult to buy and hold. And so does the commission-free trading. Now that everything's free, mm-hmm. it's so tempting to trade all the time. Um, although I think, I think a bear market will help cure that <laughs> naturally. Um, but yeah, I think um, most, uh, most investors who live through a bear market buy a low-cost index fund and they're like, you know what, I'm good. And this is something that I interviewed Michael Lewis about, the writer, and I, because I, I was curious why he never covered Vanguard or Bogle in any of his books, and I knew he was a Vanguard investor. Mm-hmm. And what he said was interesting, which is what a lot of people echoed, which is a low-cost index fund allowed me to not, it, it freed up my time. Yeah. And so they actually liked resigning to the fact this is the best deal. Now they never have to even follow the markets. Some people like to, and I think that's those people probably, uh, they get, even if they lose money a little bit, they get some pleasure out of trading. No, it's legal, no problem. Mm-hmm. But for many people, they, they'd rather not think about it. And I think that the index fund really helped people uh, have more time because of that sort of idea that they, they're now going to buy and hold with this thing. They, they found their vehicle. They yeah. are now good for 40 years. And that's, that again is part of what I tried to describe in the book because again there's many books written by advisors who talk about buying and holding and when you read at the end like what they do with their own money or what they advise it's buy an index fund that's why I partially wanted to write this book and one up. thing that I've been thinking about with respect to buy and hold recently just with the bear market and with there's a lot of talk right now about commodities or about like the future of crypto and all of this And, you know, you had made the comment that the most active part for the retail investor typically is determining that asset allocation. What are you going to bring in? What do you, if if you're going to, you know, forego the just buy and hold VTSAX or VTI, and you're going to introduce other elements, I'm kind of wondering where do we draw the line with buy and hold? As in what truly constitutes buying and holding? If I'm buying and holding for a year and then I decide that, hey, uh, actually, I want to change my asset allocation because I'm observing some trend or I'm reacting to something in the market. Am I buying and holding anymore or am I now kind of, you know, wading into waters that I shouldn't be? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think in that case, you're not buying and holding. Uh, (laughs) You are a victim of your own emotions. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You know, in the book, in the Art of Doing Nothing chapter, I... I basically take a second to say nothing isn't totally correct. It's more not deviating from a long-term plan. You know, if you rebalance, that's fine. You know, uh, let's say your stocks go up a lot and now they make up 90% instead of 80%. Well, maybe you sell some and then rebalance into bonds. That's not, that's buying and holding, even though you made a trade there. Uh, So I I would, I would say that's probably legit buying and holding. The other thing that we've noticed, which is that people might have an 80% core boring vanilla buy and hold portfolio but they go a little crazy on the with the 20 percent and so you can be a buy and hold investor who likes to get a little crazy on the outskirts in my opinion Mm -hmm. and it's even a behavioral hack arguably to occupying yourself with the 20 percent crazy stuff if it saves you from touching the 80 percent because the 80 percent has to grow like a tree and you know you could sit in the backyard watching a tree grow you would go insane Mm -hmm. So for people who like to watch their account every day, it's almost like maybe useful to buy some thematic ETFs or crypto, something to just, I don't know, keep your hands busy yeah. if that's what it takes. Like in the Michael Lewis case, that's a person who put everything into boring and they're fine with it because they love the time. And what's interesting is, and what's part of the Bogle effect is, the more the core gets boring, the crazier the out- mm. outskirt stuff gets. NFTs, crypto, ARC, thematic ETFs. And so ultimately, I bet Bogle passive, would have loved thematic ETFs. Oh yeah, <laughs> if I told him that was what his work had, he's produced rolling that, he over would, in his grave. Yeah, oh saying. absolutely, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think that's just where the fifteen twenty percent of the money is in that brain, and then you just the eighty percent is not touched. Yeah. If you if you do that, I would consider you a buy and holder. Hmm. I like it. So yes, but you, but almost using mental tricks on yourself yeah. to to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So on the crypto note, I heard you say in another interview, I think it was the one with the Red Holtz guys on Compound and Friends, that you think crypto's ethos is a little bit ironic, that like they seem to love Wall Street participation, despite the whole stick it to the man, DeFi 
ethos um and you had mentioned you know that this like wall street bull with laser eyes at the bitcoin conference is a little bit at odds with this like every man 99 percent message of crypto uh, i would love to hear you expound on that because i i am in your camp frankly um and i would agree with you that you know in the book or in the interview you had mentioned that like hey you know low-cost index funds are way more stick it to the man and like fuck wall street than crypto is but i just would love to hear you expound a little bit on that oh yeah i mean th look uh i think bogle is is way more DeFi in spirit and ethos than most DeFi. Um, and, and he should be translated that way. That's why I had Matt Hogan write the forward who is, works at Bitwise. Uh, I wanted a crypto person to sort of try to square the gap between crypto and Bogle, and Matt did a good job of that. And I have friends in crypto. I understand it's a very intriguing um, area, mm -hmm. and the Fed has done a, a lot to devalue the currency, and so, hey, here's something that's like a new gold. I, you know, And a lot of smart people are involved. So yeah. um, I almost see somebody describe crypto as almost you got to look at crypto as like some high growth tech stock. Mm. There's a lot of smart people involved. Um, and if you treat it like that, I think you, you can avoid getting caught into the religious aspect of it. I think that's where somebody put all their money in crypto and you think it's going to like the whole, you know, system's going to go down. I, I don't know. I'm a little weary of that. I think the other thing is the people who run the crypto exchanges have become, you know, Jeff Bezos type rich, maybe not that rich, but very, but very wealthy. wealthy. Yeah. Very wealthy. And you know, Bogle, I, I feel, actually denied himself that so that the investors could have more and Bogle would never hire Larry David to do a commercial <laughs> for Vanguard. I mean, there's just many things that are more true DeFi and, and that, that crypto seems to be falling into the same traps as wall street. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, money, can, money, money can corrupt you. Yeah. And that's why Bogle's so special. He seemed to just deny himself that, which ultimately I think staved off any chances of corruption. Um, so, you know, it's capitalist. I get these exchanges set up early. They, they deserve money because they, they, it's all legal. Yeah. It's just, is it really different than wall street right. or is it just a new wall street where it's active trading? People are getting rich. I used to say that crypto exchanges and the fees they charge for trading would make a 1970s stockbroker jealous. Um, that's how good they have it over there. It, it produced four times more revenue than all the ETF volume did for market makers and that they did 30 times more volume. Wow. Um, and the other problem is crypto is uh, it's only worth what someone else will pay for it. Whereas what Bogle was preaching was go into the stock market because these companies actually produce things and you actually there's cash flow and value here. Yeah. And that's what you're that's what we're doing. We're not mm -hmm. trying to outsmart it or trade. We're just going to slowly benefit from all that value in the forms of dividends and earnings growth. And that that's real. That's tangible. The key is to is to kill all the stuff in the that stands in the in the way between that and your and your account. Yeah, that I think is my beef with like the crypto thing is is that the the behavior and the narrative to me do not coalesce. There's a pretty wide like divergence between the way they position themselves or the way it positions itself and like the reality of of how things are playing out. You ever notice that like when when it says oh JP Morgan has just started a crypto trading desk. <laughs> They they celebrate that. They're like, yeah, JP yeah. Morgan. Yeah, Look, I'm like, wait, didn't you hate JP us. Morgan? Isn't that the enemy? <laughs> yeah, it's like, wait a second. So, <laughs> I thought we were out deregulation here, not like let's yeah, get the yeah. biggest bank in the yeah. Oh, yeah, man. I don't I don't be too hard on them. It, it is yeah. an interesting space, but there's definitely some uh, some inconsistencies there with their messaging. Oh, totally. So on the cost piece, I think your book did a really good job of putting a really fine point on just how much. Bogle and his philosophy changed Wall Street pretty much for everybody. And you use some examples of like, you know, Goldman Sachs having like the Marcus product. How do you think these banks now market differently, like to the masses because of him? Yeah, I mean, it, they, they the, the thing is the people have caught on. Um, so now they have to sort of have low cost products. And what's interesting, if you talk to them, I, I think they're in, even though they Bogle brought them there kicking and screaming, they like that they are on that train. Um, people in the ETF and, and, and robo-advisor world, are they really want to feel good about what they do every morning and not sell something they wouldn't use themselves. And that's, I think, part of what the active fund world suffers from. A lot of the people are in Vanguard funds, even though they're selling active. Um, I think with some of these 
Wall Street firms, they're now actually putting out stuff that they too would invest in. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, that's what's interesting is he had a major impact, not just on Fidelity and Schwab, but, but Wall Street as well. Yeah. Um, everybody, like even like JP Morgan has like a two basis point uh, total or large cap ETF. Um, and the reason they have it, obviously, is because uh, investors want it. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, you know, I used to say um, the expense ratio is the new past performance chart. It is the first thing people look at. It's what they trust. They do not trust the charts anymore. Yeah. And they, they so I think that's, they all, they all had to do it. Uh, but I think ultimately they, they appreciate what he did. And, and that's another reason about the book is that Vanguard provided me a, a key or a ticket to go into many areas because it's not just mutual funds. ETFs were impacted by Vanguard, obviously, yeah. heavily. The wealth management business, and now Vanguard is starting a wealth manager. The trading platform, Vanguard was the first to go commission free ETFs. Um, and then you look at behavior, uh, all of the different areas, smart beta, ESG, Vanguard uh, is right there. And so in international, there's a whole thing about international investors where uh, the, the system is, is harder to get index funds in, but ultimately it'll, it'll happen there too. So um, yeah, that's why I call it the Bogle effect, mm-hmm. uh, because the effect, if you trace it out, it takes you all over the place and it, it touches all Wall Street, the whole ecosystem and the whole world, frankly. Um, it's, it's just astonishing. Uh, so <laughs> that's why that blown away feeling that I, I slowly came to on my own is what I tried to share in the book. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Eric, thank you so much for being here. We will definitely link the book in the description. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Absolutely. All right, y'all. That's all for this week. Before we go, comment below what you thought was the most interesting part of our conversation. And remember to like and subscribe to our channel. I will see you next week, same time, same place, on The Money with Katie Show. Our show is a production of Morning Brew and is produced by Nick Torres and me. Sarah Singer is our VP of Multimedia, and additional content editing comes from our lovely senior editor, Hannah Velez. Our video producer is Christy Muldoon, and Sam Cat is our Vice President of Chaos, and Jojo Beans is our Chief of Woof, barking at any passerby, regardless of how well the recording is going.